It is good to be in God's house. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to say a few things before we start into God's Word this morning. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1 in just a minute. But I want to say how nice it is to see you. These new lights that were put in, I want to say thank you to everybody that came and worked so hard and getting the new lights put in. I, I thought it would, in my mind, I'm always thinking stuff up. I think this will probably take about 50 hours for six people to do. And guys, we did this in 31 man hours. So we started at 10 in the morning. At 4.30, we were sweeping up and cleaning up. And just thank you to everyone who came out and helped put these lights in. We did all the, the sanctuary, I mean, all the fellowship hall, kitchen, uh, furnace room, every Sunday school room that had these kind of lights in here in the sanctuary and the entranceway. And uh, especially thank you to Brother Jamie for giving us a good young man. I kept noticing, us old guys would be barely, and here he'd be flying along with them hands up in there, you know, and uh, we just it, it had a good time of fellowship, had a good time of witnessing. Then we ran into one problem that we could not have fixed, and uh, Noah had already said that he had to leave. And I want to thank you, Noah, for staying an extra 25, 30 minutes. Do you see this one, two, three, fourth light up? For some reason, every light in this sanctuary junc junctions all that. We, all of a sudden, we all go black. And uh, we would have never been able to figure that out without an electrician. But thank you, Brother Noah, for staying until we got that and uh, got that back on track and uh, had to do some other work and that, that slowed us down a little while on that, but thank you to everybody. I think it looks bright. I told Calvin, Calvin, you can't wear dark clothes and fall asleep no more on me, buddy. Well, you can, but everybody will see you now, though, Calvin. You know. No, it is It is very nice to see these bright lights. And uh, uh, it just it's. Uh, I noticed a difference when Brother Jeremy was preaching Wednesday night on the uh, Facebook page. It just brightened up everything there. And, I told Jeremy, I'm going to start washing my face and everything with all these lights up here. But anyway, all kidding aside, I do thank everyone that was able to come and work. And I think we had started out with about eight, and I finally, some had to leave for this reason or that reason. And, and But guys, it was just amazing. I, I, my big hope was we were going to get the fellowship all done at the whole church. And I, again, thank you so much. It means a lot. All right, so if you have your Bible with you this morning, please open up to book of Galatians chapter 6 and we'll start in verse 1 this is our 15th message from the book of Galatians and we've, in the first 14 we've come as far as chapter 6 verse 1 now I'm going to give you a little summary here hopefully like 5 cents the book of Galatians is a letter or a book written with one overriding message we are free from the law for our salvation in fact, I want to read a couple of verses here to you about that. Back in chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But no man is justified by the law. Now, this is not thought. I could have chosen one from each chapter or two. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for you. You know this. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Three times that's in the Bible. Quoting the book of Habakkuk in the New Testament. The book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, and here in the book of Galatians. In chapter 4, verse 5, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, hallelujah, fulfilled the promise, made of a woman, made under the law. Why? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so, some churches are afraid of this book. They're terrified of this book of the Bible. I know pastors that won't teach it. They'll, oh, no, 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 no. This will tell people they're, they're free. Yes, we are. We are free, though. That's the whole point. We're free not to have to sin. We're free not to have to lust and live in, in ungodliness. We're free to serve God. We're free to love each other. And I loved all those songs this morning about serving, serving God, service. I'll be of service to you, Lord. I'll go look for those that need help. So in our outline, I'm not going to get our outline out, but I gave you about several weeks ago. If you don't have one of the outlines on the book of Galatians, uh, then, then see me after church and I'll get you one. Chapter 5 and 6 are called the practical parts. 
He does all this theology, building up to this. And then chapter 5 and 6, he just says, here's the nuts and bolts of it. And this is very practical. We looked at last week, the fruit of the Spirit. Chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, always is, it's continuously, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You know, there's a law against all those works of the flesh. Back up in verse 19 and 20, there's law against idolatry and witchcraft and adultery and murder and strife. There's no law against loving each other. There's no law against being faithful to God. There's no law in being temperate and meek. So I love that. Now, nah, so this is, again, a practical thing. In fact, it's going to be so practical today. You know what it says? You even see it in the title. It's a how-to message. Now, I don't do very many of those because I just try to preach what the Bible says. But Paul gets very how-to here. Kind of like the practical lessons in our Sunday school book. This is, this is how you apply this, okay? So he's going to tell us helpful hints on how to love. And no, I see all of y'all in the red. I didn't do this because it's Valentine's Day. This is just the verse where we stopped at last week, okay? But helpful hints on how to love. Three things. Seek the fallen, verse 1 through 5. And I'll bring up that line in a minute. Support the teachers, verse 6 through 8. And then verse 9 and 10, sustain good works. Very practical. So let's read verses 1 through 5, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Brethren, <laughs> wow, brethren, that's a good way to start out, isn't it? He's not writing this to unbelievers. Brethren, brothers, sisters, your translation may say, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. There's one of those, that fruit of the spirit, the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest I also be tempted. Now, I, I, I'm afraid I won't remember when I go back through this verse by verse. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you now. This word considering is a very, very strong word. It's the word skopios. And you say, well, that doesn't mean it. it does mean something to you. Because what do you do if you're going to examine something very, very small? We use a microscope. If you're going to see something far away, you use a telescope. Yeah, that, this, that, that's the Greek word here, skopios. It means to examine something. Not just to look at it, but to examine it closely. So, who's he say examine? The, the fallen brother? No. Examine yourself real close, lest I also be tempted. Right, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And that's a good law to fulfill. It would be nice if we could fulfill the law of Moses, but no one has ever done it, not even Moses except for Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the only one to live completely by the law of God. But you can fulfill the law of Christ by loving each other. Bear one another's burdens. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. Y'all ever met any self-deceivers? Come on, let's smile a little bit. People that think they're a lot better than they are. You know, I know me and you got the same pickup, but mine, same model, but mine's a thousand times better than yours because it's mine. You know guys like that. Better than guys. Always better than. You know, better this, better that. Well, guys, he said here, you can't be a better than. If you're gonna if you're gonna help people, you better be thinking of yourself and not be thinking more highly than you should. I remember God, this wasn't part of the message, but just come to my mind. I remember a, a, a group of young boys, probably I'm guessing 10 to 15 years old, a scattered kind of aging group, and they built a clubhouse and they had three rules. And I'll never forget these three rules. Nobody act big, nobody act small, and back regular. And I thought, that's pretty good, man. That's pretty good rules right there, God. If you do that, everybody can get along, couldn't you? If everybody just act regular, okay? So, and that's all he said here. Don't deceive yourself. But let every man prove his own work. And then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone. And not in another. You won't be rejoicing because somebody else messed up and they've fallen and been overtaken. For every man shall bear his own burden. And we'll, we'll explain that in a few minutes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do love you this morning. Thank you for the good singing. And oh God, for all these songs that focus on us serving you and serving each other. And that's exactly what we want to do today. 
Help us to be less like ourselves and more like you. Oh, God, I pray. Bless this church. We can have a revival. Please, Lord God, we would need a revival so badly. Uh, I know that our churches believe in the truth and we worship you. Lord, we want an evangelistic revival. We want to see our people saved according to your will. And I'll say this, Lord, either give us revival or give us rapture. Get us out of here. Father, we love you. We want to see your kingdom grow or either be in your kingdom. Father, we, we pray that you bless us today. Open up our hearts and minds. Help us to be very practical. What can we do to show love to each other? Father, we thank you for what we're about to receive from your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. First of all, seek the fall. Okay? Verse 1 through 5 that I just read to you. Now, there's three big words here in verse 1. One another, overtake it, and restore one another is one of the most important words in all of Christianity. Now, I just this did take two minutes or so. Over ten times in the New Testament, it tells us we are to love one another. So it must be important. James chapter 5, verse 16, pray one for another. Romans chapter 12, prefer one another in love. 1 Peter chapter 4, in hospitality, serve one another. And here... Look out for one another. If someone is overtaken in a fault, hmm, bear you one another's burdens. I just said verse 1 and 2. So, so we need to keep this in mind that, that we are to, to, to put others... doesn't mean that you're a nobody, but it means that you need to be willing to lay your selfishness aside to reach out to someone else. Try to be more like Christ, to be... To focus on others more than yourself. And so that, that's how we start out. And then he says, here's the issue. If a man be overtaken in a fall. All right. Overtaken. Now what's that mean? To be overtaken. Well, the Greek word means to be surprised or stumbling. Okay? But how can you be overtaken in a fall? It says a fall there. Well, I'll tell you that. Because you think you can do just a little bit of sin... And it won't affect you. Now this is definitely somebody that's in sin. It's not like they were walking along, oh, I sin. No, 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 no. They knew they were in sin. They just like all of us do think we, don't, we won't be snared by our sins. This person now all of a sudden finds out they're overtaken in their sin. They're surprised by it. But I go back to a lesson that was taught in youth class. I'm guessing I was 12, 13 years old at Pressville Free Will Baptist Church. And the youth teacher says this. I know you've all heard it. It wasn't the original lesson with him. But he said this. Sin takes you further than you want to go. Sin keeps you longer than you want to stay. And sin costs you more than you want to pay. Nobody says, oh, I really hope I can mess up my Christianity and be a failure. But start flirting with sin that's what's happened to this person. So what are we going to do? We're going to hate them because they've been overtaken in the fall? We're going to look down on them and say, well, I would never, I would never be caught up with lust. I would never. And you, you think that's how you help somebody? Act like you're better than everybody else? So he says, if someone is overtaken in a fault, and it is a fault, there's no hiding that, wouldn't be much of a Christian if you said somebody's in fault, but we'll just close her. We don't care. We don't mind if they if they keep stumbling along and say, what kind of pastor would that be? What kind of church member would that be? You see one of your brothers or sisters in the Lord overtaken in a fault and you just pretend like it doesn't matter. No. You which are spiritual. Now let's deal with that. Who are the spiritual? Well, there's the ones that are walking with the Spirit. And, and have the fruit of the Spirit. That, every believer has the fruit of the Spirit in their life. It's impossible. Not like the gifts of the Spirit. Some people have some gifts, some have. This fruit is singular. So we, all of us have this fruit in us. We just need to let it mature and ripen and do the right things. So it did say, you that are perfect, restore such a one. But you that are trying to follow God. You may say, I'm not qualified to help them. If God spoke to your heart about it, it must be your responsibility to do something about it. Amen. Hmm. Well, you know, he's like that, you know. He really thinks that you belong to him. He really thinks you're his servant. 
Well, yeah, that's that what we sing and say. I'm a servant of the Lord. I, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll, I'll, I'll follow God. He believes that. So that's why he doesn't mind a bit to tell you to do something that might make you feel uncomfortable. Because you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the master. The very word, master. He's the one that's in charge. So, uh, we're there spiritual, not perfect, but spiritual minded. Have got to restore this person. Now, restoration is a hard thing. If a fellow Christian sins, are we supposed to stain their reputation or seek the restoration? Huh. Still said, I could never, I would never. Attacking the fallen. Let's try to restore them. Now this word restore, I think all of y'all know what restore means. It means to build something back. But this is a particular fun word. It's a word that means to set a broken bone. Now, by raising hands, how many of y'all have ever had a broken bone? All right, over half of us. Was it fun getting that bone set back in place? No. It hurts to get a bone set back in place, okay? But that's the word that's used here. It's, it's a word that means to set back a broken bone. So Paul knows this may be painful. It's also the exact same word when Jesus is calling his first disciples. He goes by... These fishermen, it says they are mending their nets. Same word, restore. Same Greek word. So, mending the nets, that's needful, isn't it? You ain't going to catch fish if your nets got holes in them. But guys, I've noticed something. The part of the net that you mend, if you have a little, maybe, minnow strainer or something you're catching, that part becomes stronger than the rest of the net because it's new, okay? Yeah. Oftentimes, a broken bone, when it's reset, becomes almost impossible to break in. Not always, understand that. I'm just saying, it's needful and it's painful, but we need to restore people. Our goal should be restoration. Not allow sin to just overtake them and keep them. They've been overtaken in the fall. Let's go to them. Let's, let's do what is right. Let's be Christians. Not gossip about them. But go and help set them right. Mend them back. It's not for lazy people. It is for loving people. Now, how to restore. Now, I didn't fill this in because I want you to, okay? You said, I wish our preacher would tell us something practical. Well, you're in luck today. Because Paul gives us four things to do. One, two, three, four. Paul's like he's writing a how-to book here. You want to know how to restore someone? that's fallen into sin, instead of just blaming them, jumping onto them. I heard a guy say one time, uh, I guess it's probably over 40 years ago, said, the Christian army is the only army in the world that shoots its own wounded. I think that's true sometimes. So here's what he says to do. Four things. How do you restore a fallen sister, a fallen brother? Number one, if you're taking notes, in the spirit of meekness. It's gentle. It may be hard work, but it can't be brute work. Uh, let me ask you guys another question. I didn't have this written down last, but I want to ask this in it. How many of y'all, when y'all got y'all's bone th uh, set, thought the doctor was purposely rough with you? <laughs> I did too, Jimmy. I mean, maybe me and you just big sissies or something, Jimmy, but I'm telling you what, I they didn't have to do that. I, the first time I'd ever heard of a PA, I broke it. I cut my toe off. I'm not going to tell you how. And, 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 and at, at that job, and yeah, you know, and she was just a hateless thing. No mercy at all. She said, "This is going to hurt." And I thought, "You're not kidding. It's going to hurt." I cut my toe off. She's so yeah. You know, she, she, she was just the grumpiest person in the world. Maybe she's a sweet Christian. I don't know. Maybe it's because I was such a baby that day, Cal. I don't know. But give me a piece of advice. Don't cut your toe off and go to a grumpy doctor. Okay. Now. But in the spirit of meekness, with gentleness, the Holy Spirit gives us this meekness. It's not like you've got to manufacture your meekness. Remember, you can't manufacture fruit. It grows by something that's alive. Meekness, verse 23 in the chapter before. Meekness, gentleness, under control. Walk in the spirit and not after the law. 
So you go to that person in meekness. You go there for the purpose of helping, even if they may be like me and Jimmy, a bad patient to start with, okay? You go and gentleness, you help them out, okay? Number two, with caution. With caution. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You must look intently at yourself. Examine closely. What are my motives? Am I doing this for my own self-pleasure? Am I doing this to try to just make them feel better about their sin? Or am I doing this to actually mend them back up with their relationship with Jesus Christ? Consider yourself lest you also be tempted. Lest the deceiver, Satan, he's so good at his job. Lest Satan tempts you either through pride or maybe the same sin that this person's fallen into. So, number two, use caution, okay? Number three, by caring. <coughs> Bear you one another's burdens. Bear. It's an imperative. You know what that means. Remember from like uh, what 10th grade English class we started learning imperatives. It means it's a command. You're commanded. Bear is also a present tense. It means keep doing it. Keep bearing each other's burdens. Try to help them. If you see someone that's in need, try to help them bear that burden up, okay? And then look for someone else and try to help them and look for someone else. Try, always just be trying to have this attitude. Caring for one another. Taking away part of their burden. Helping them against one another. And it's the same word. You know what this word one another here is? There's two, and I love the Greek language because it's, it's not like our language uh, that's not very expressive. In the Greek language, it's, uh, there's two different Greek words for another. One is heteros. That okay? means another of, the, of a different kind, like we're heterosexual. You're, you're attracted to another sex, okay? Now, so the other word is alion. That's the word that's used here. It means another of the exact same kind. Do you understand that this person you're helping is the same as you? This person that you're helping is exact as you. He's part of the, that's why it starts out, brother. He is part of the family of God. He is not a slave for you to beat down on. He's a fellow child for you to lift up and to help. We, we, we're equals in the family. We belong to each other. And so he says, Bear one another's burdens. Huh. Now, verse 5. Let's skip over to verse 5 because I love when people say the Bible makes a mistake. It doesn't. Bear you one another's burdens. But then verse 5 says, For every man shall bear his own burdens. This is an unfortunate translation, but I think anybody that thinks about it could figure it out without knowing Greek, okay? There's two different Greek words for burden here. The first one in verse 2 is a massive chest. It's a something that would come on a cargo ship. It's something that you have to get on the other side of. You, you remember in the, in the book of Romans, where I think we may have read this this morning before Sunday school class, where it says that the Spirit, we did, helpeth us. He gets on the other end. Even when we don't know how to pray for ourselves, He gets on the other end. That's the word that's used here. It, it's, a, it's a heavy burden. And so when you have someone that has a heavy burden, you need to help them carry it. The other word burden here is after he's been admonishing them not to deceive themselves, prove your own work. And he says, because you've got to bear your own burden, it's the word basically that means a backpack. Okay? Like a soldier's backpack. It's something you should be able to carry yourself. Huh. One is something that temporarily... The Lord has put on someone that is so big. Remember it says He won't give you anything greater than you can bear. That's because sometimes somebody else is supposed to be helping you bear it. Because this is a big burden. I don't know what it is. But then you've got to carry your own burdens. Now let me use this illustration. See if this helps a little bit. What if you called me and said, Would you take my children to school this morning? My car is broke down. Well, that'd be a little burden I can help you out with, right? So I can go get, get your children, take them to school. 
What if six months later you're still calling me every morning saying, I can tell you just crawled out. Can you take my children to school? You know what I've done? I've ruined you. I have, I have, I have been, it's a burden. I, maybe, here's what I always say. How do you know which one? Start out, just help it. If it's a burden, you might think they can carry themselves. You just still do verse 2. You start helping, okay? But if you see that you're not being a help, but you're being an enabler, then you've got to start backing off that help a little bit. Can I say one more thing about this before we look? I know I can't because I'm preaching. So, so let me say one more thing about this. What might be too... You might look at something and say, that's a pretty easy burden. Sister Patsy should be able to carry that. But does anybody in here really think that Kai can carry the same thing that Calvin can carry? No! See, so you've got to look and see where is somebody in their spiritual life, not how long they've been saved, but where they're at right now today. What, what are they under today? What are they suffering today? You may say, well, I can do that. Well, maybe they need a little help. Maybe they need a little smile or a friendly word. That'll help them bear their burden. Maybe it'll be that you just need to Take them to the Lord in prayer and bear one another's burdens. I don't know. He doesn't give us exact details. He just tells us that we are to care. Okay, so, so how do we do this? Number one, in meekness. Number two, with caution. Make sure you're doing it the right way for the right motives. Number three, caring. Fulfilling the law of Christ. And then number four, by not comparing. Verse three and four. For if a man think himself to be something when he's not. He's deceiving himself. And I've known a lot of self-deceivers. Huh. So be careful by not comparing. I'm going to say this. If you blow my candle out, it doesn't make your candle shine a bit brighter. So there's no point in going around. That's what the legalists, he's talking to the legalists there at the church. These law keepers. Well, I'll just put him down. Just do away with him. You guys... I'm better than them. That's, that's the attitude that you come across with. And guys, we need to make sure that we understand that we're all made out of the same dust of the earth. And I love this book of Psalm when the psalmist says, He remembers that I am but dust. I'm glad God remembers that, aren't you? All right. So here's my best illustration for this. Anybody in here that's the, the most important person in here, if you think about this, we run a, a glass of water for everybody in here. And you put your finger down in that water. And you take your finger out. Does it take five minutes to fill in where your finger used to be? Because you're better than anybody else. No, you got to figure it out, don't you? It's all the same. Okay, guys, you're not better than anybody else. You may be living better. You may be praying harder. But that's because God wants you to be spiritual so you can do His work. Somebody say amen. 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 Come on. All right. So bear one another's burdens. Don't try to cheat them out of the, uh, and do everything for them, but, but in love. And, and like I said, if you don't know whether it's enabling or bearing, fall on the side of bearing to start with. Fall on the side of loving them and helping them. And then you can then go from there. Next thing, a little faster, support the teachers. Verse 6 through 8. Let him that is taught in the word, got full hints on how to love, communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived. Attitude counts. God is not bought. I'm sure nobody in here thinks that they can fool God and make fun of God. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Literally, the word is rotting flesh. Or the ideal is rotting flesh. If you sow to the flesh, what you're going to reap is rotting flesh. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Hallelujah. Which one do you want? You want a, you want a dead carcass hung around your neck? Carrying it around, smelling like death all the time, or do you want life? So he said it. Now we, uh, we apply verse 7 and 8 to lost people a lot, and there's several places in the Bible, because this, this uh, principle of sowing and reaping is used in Old Testament, New Testament, several different books of the Bible. 
But here in particular, he's using it about your financial giving. About giving. Let him that let, let him that is taught the word. So it's talking about a local assembly. Communicate unto him, the church, that teaches in all good things. Now, I used to hear Julius Caesar Bragg, which I still think is the coolest name for a, for a pastor. Brother J.C. Bragg used to say this all the time. I, I can't imitate him very good, Debbie, but he'd say something like this. You cannot go down to Bartram's grocery store and get your groceries and go over and play, pay Clay Brothers. They'll put you in jail. <laughs> he, had, he also, the guy said, trying to have revival without Jesus like trying to sweep the creek back up there against the stream. I mean, he, he just was, always had good things, cool things, way of putting stuff. But he's right. You are to pay where the groceries are, are taken from. And what Paul is saying here is to this church at Galatia that's so caught up in rules and regulation, let's be practical. Let's start showing love for each other. You need to give. And, and again, this word communicates another one of the words like one another that's just used over and over in the Bible. I've got a couple of them written down here. It's usually translated fellowship or giving. Same word. Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 have a common fellowship in Christ. Jude verse 3 common fellowship in the faith. Book of Philippians. Fellowship in the spirit. Fellowship in the shop. The workshop. Fellowship in the sufferings. And here in the fellowship in the finances. He's speaking specifically I know about the pastor teacher but people don't give directly to the pastor teacher. You give to the local assembly. Guys this is always tough to share but I do because we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse through the Bible. I have never had a complaint with Calvary Baptist Church. In fact, as though you know that a 10 business meeting last January, over a year ago, took forever, I talked the deacons into cutting my salary $9,000. Guys, let me tell you what. The Lord is good to me and Debbie. And, I, and I've never been unappreciative of what the church has done. Guys, this church is the most generous church I've ever known of. You start looking, look at the little thing, because we, by law we have to post that every year, how much money the church takes in and what it does with the money, the big broad things. Last year took in $102,000 and gave $41,000 away to missions, to food pantry ministry, and to local people in need in our community. You tell me God ain't good? God's good. Amen. God's good. And I'm telling you, you can't outgive God. You just think, oh, well, we'll go broke. No, no, no. God just keeps blessing. But we must remember. And there's a lesson right here. If you want to write a practical lesson down, it's this. What we do with material things is evidence of how we value spiritual things. What we do with material things is an evidence of how we value spiritual things. The tithe is the Lord. It belongs to God. Huh. I'm going to take you to Jesus. Jesus said this. Matthew chapter 6 verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I always thought Jesus got that wrong. <laughs> Thank you for laughing, Carl. I think the rest of think I'm serious. I know Jesus didn't get it wrong. But it does sound backwards, doesn't it? I would think that your Treasure follows your heart. But that's not true. Your heart follows your treasure. So Jesus went on to say, if you invest in, he's talking about money, financial things. If you invest in spiritual things, your heart will follow. You want to know how to start really praying for a missionary? Start giving to them every month. You'll be interested in what that newsletter says then. You'll be excited to find out what God is doing. Uh, how many of y'all have money invested in GM stock right now? I don't either. That's why I could care less what GM's doing, okay? But back at a time when I had a little bit, not much, made five or six thousand dollars in a mutual fund, I, had, I used to love to check. I'd like, like the Rockefeller checking out. I just made two cents today, Danny. You know, I mean, you know. But since we sold that, I looked one time because I could care less. Because my treasure ain't there, my heart ain't there. Guys, if you want your treasure, if you want Calvary Baptist to, 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 to grow and you want to be part of what God's doing, very clearly Jesus is telling us that you need to make 
this your treasure. He's talking about finances. Jesus was. Because then the Pharisees got kind of upset. He said, well, listen, you tithe everything you ought to, but you should not leave the weightier measures undone. You swallow a camel and gag at a gnat. So tithing don't make you saved or anything, Jesus said, but you ought to do it, though. All right, so two reasons, two practical reasons, down-to-earth reasons, why people don't give. Number one is they're selfish. They're material. They would rather spend their money on something else than to give their tithes and offerings to the Lord. By the way, in the New Testament, it talks about tithes and offerings, but most of the time it talks about grace giving because, because for believers, we're not like the Jews. We're not under the law. We're not tied to just 10%. You should give all, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. So one reason that people don't give is because they're materialists. I'm just being honest with you. And they're not spiritual. Second reason people don't give, and I think this is the one that affects most people in that I know in our area, they're afraid to give. They're afraid God can't meet their needs. They're afraid that God will let them down. I barely make it. If I give my tithes, how am I going to make it? Well, in only one place in the entire Bible, only one place ever, where God says put him to the test, because other places, do not try the Lord thy God. But one time he says, put me to the test. I'm going to read it to you so I don't misquote. Book of Malachi. Chapter 3, verse 10. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, into the, into the temple, to the, to, for us, the local church, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and will not pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive it. I love this. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Satan is a devourer. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast forth her fruit before the time of the field, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, put me to the test and see if I'm not good for it. Reminds me I, don't, I may have been Dr. Picker really told me this 35, 36 years ago about orphans in Europe after World War II. They, were, they had lost everything, their homes, their parents, families. Now they were put in these orphanages. They were well taken care of, good clothes, much paid for by Canadian and American dollars because Europe was in a mess. And, but they found that these children multitudes of them, the vast majority of them, would not sleep at night. Because you got to remember, they went to bed one night with a mommy and a daddy. And food to eat. And the next morning, they had no mommy and daddy. No home. But they were so well taken. They tried to explain to them, you've got everything. We love you. We're going to help you. All these things. And then one person got an idea that affected all of Europe. Give them a piece of bread when they go to bed. Almost none of the bread was eaten. They'd have their bread for breakfast in the morning. Because at least they knew if the Germans came again, they'd have a piece of bread. And see, I submit to you, you have the bread of life in your heart. And the bread of heaven in your soul. You don't have to be afraid that God will let you down. If it was me making a promise, or Brother Ray making a promise to you, you know, something like that. I'd say, well, I don't know. But God made a promise. So put him to the test and see if he's true or not. Be not deceived. God is not bought. For who whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Put God to the test. He's not saying you'll be rich, you'll have everything. But did you see that? He won't let old Satan devour you. <laughs> I love that. It's not even... I don't even know... I don't know how God works. I wish He never... Somebody says, what? And I've had people, many people, when you pastored for 38 years, a lot of people ask you this question. What's God want me to do with my life? And I tell them all the same answer. Let's pray. You don't know? I don't know what God wants me to do next week. He don't lead us with a... He don't give us a big thing out there and say, next Thursday you... No, no, no. He just leads us. He just helps us. He directs us. You know. But I'm saying put God to the test. 
And I think you'll find out that God will bless you. I'm not, maybe financially, that may be what he decides to do. But I guarantee you the devourer won't come. And I guarantee you this, the Bible says, I've never seen my seed forsaken or out begging for bread. That's a, the book says that. That's a word right there, guys. Okay. Then finally. Okay. Finally. And that is the last part here, verse 9 and 10. You seek the fallen. You support God's house. Practical ways to show love. And then lastly, he says, and it kind of grows out of these other two, sustain good works. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have there for opportunity, let us do good. He doesn't describe it. A little less practical here. He just says do good. And to all men, not just the pastor. Do good to all men. Especially them who are in the household of faith. So let's deal with the first part first. The all men. Actually, you see the word man is in a tout. It's just all. It means men and women. It's not picking the same men. The legalist always wants to know this. Who is my neighbor? You remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus says, who can you be a neighbor to? You say, why should I be good to? Who should I be good to? Well, he says right there, be good to everybody. But then he puts a qualifier there. Especially them that are in the household of faith. Charity begins at home. You know someone that you know personally someone in your local church, someone that you personally or spiritually invested with, maybe a neighbor could be, but especially those that are in the household of faith, we owe a greater okay, qualifier. We, we owe more to other believers that serve the same Messiah we do than we do to everyone else. As we therefore have opportunity, God will give us opportunity, do good to all men, but especially when people say, well, if I had two people in need and one was a sinner and one was a Christian, I should give to the sinner. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. The book says here, not, not just here, I can also show you in 1 Corinthians, the book says, first, look out for the brother or sister in the Lord because that's your family. And you remember this, the blood of the covenant is stronger than the water of birth. The blood of the covenant, that's what makes a difference in our lives. Now, so let's go to the next one. Keep doing good. Up in verse 9. Let us not be weary, discouraged, your translation may say, tired, but let's keep doing well. Let's keep doing what is right. It is hard sometimes. It's so hard to help a fallen brother, especially if they fall again in the same sin. But you know what? Go back again. Help bear their burdens. Do all until the Holy Spirit tells you not to. You just keep helping and working. And you will be tired. It's hard work. It's not for the lazy. And let us not be weary in well-doing. It's going to take more than your words. It's going to take your works. And then he uses this strange word here. For we, for in due season we shall reap. We know the rules, uh, the law of sowing and reaping. Okay, so... If you, whatever you sow, you don't you don't sow corn and reap tomatoes. Okay, if you want tomatoes, you got to plant tomatoes. Okay, so 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 we're going to reap in kind. Okay, but then he says this: if we faint not. Now, guys, this is one of the coolest words, at least to me. I love this word. It's a word that can never happen to me. I'm telling you, it can't it can't happen to Danny or Ed or Noah either. This is a word about a pregnant woman. And that's the word that Paul chooses to use as his illustration. We shall reap if we faint not. It's a word that would describe the, the, the middle of childbirth. Not the pregnancy. The middle of childbirth. And it must be hard because they call it labor, don't they? Okay. Man, y'all ain't getting none of my jokes today. Okay, thank you, Carl. Alright, so, alright, so, alright, so, alright, so, all right, so. In the middle of this, at the hardest times, I have only been with one person when they're giving birth, and that was Debbie. And I remember that little nurse. I'm going to tell a story. Yep, I'm telling you. As she, as she is screaming and screaming, and the nurse says, 
How many more babies do you want? I don't want this one! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know what happens, guys, is because that woman has life in her. And when that child is born, so quickly, all that pain of the childbirth, when they say, that's the most beautiful thing ever. Guys, that's a cool word that Paul uses here. He never experienced it. But he says this. If we just, in the middle of the labor, remember, we're bringing life into the world. In the middle of the labor, when it's the hardest of the hardest, of the, hard, the pain's at its worst, don't faint. Don't give up. Because you're bringing life. And guys, what we've got to remember is this is life-giving stuff. So let me just say this very practically. Love one another. Seek the fallen. Support the church. Sustain good works. And I promise you, God promises you, we will reap everlasting life if we just keep loving each other. Keep believing. In you. Now, I know you have to be saved. I'm saying, but for believers, that's how you need to start. Right, this to unbelievers how to get saved. He's writing to believers how we are to act now that we are saved. Let's keep loving each other. Let's stand together. Nice. Sister Carla, she would come back from the piano. Page 366. Let's stand together as we sing this one. <laughs> the Lord God Almighty. If He's really your Lord, then you really have to be His servant, His slave. He bought you. He paid for you on Calvary. You are no longer your own. And if that's true, then we are to follow these practical things that Paul told us today. Where the rubber meets the road, we are to be faithful to God. Now let me say this to those of you that don't know Christ the Savior. If you're here today, you say, I don't know if I'm ready to go to heaven or not. Maybe you're a member of this church. Maybe you come every Sunday. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your heart with Jesus. You know where you stand with Jesus. Today, if you're not sure you're ready to go to heaven, and you'd like to be a part of all this we talked about, we invite you to come. One of the ladies will come and pray with you. One of the men will come and pray with you. Our most important thing we want today is for you to leave here today knowing I know that everything's right between me and Jesus. There may be things in your life that you need to get straightened up after that. But you've got to get saved. Straightening things up in your life won't make you saved. Come to Jesus, leave Savior, then He'll teach you how to get all these things straightened up. He'll guide you, He'll direct you. I promise you that He will. Yes, thank you, Jesus. As we sing this last verse today, you don't have to step forward to be saved. You can be saved. Up. And there's nothing special about that 60 feet or so. You can right where you're standing. You say, Lord, please come into my heart. The Bible says when you believe in your heart, you need to make confession with your mouth. Tell someone standing beside of you, I've made things right with Jesus. Let us all rejoice with you today. I've made things right with Jesus. He's changed my life. Heaven is mine. Eternal life, life everlasting, per se is mine. Thank you very much. You may be sitting.